Fabulous. So welcome everyone to the final webinar of the Cut Carbon Cut Cost series, uh, how a sustainable marketing strategy can lead to a competitive advantage. Uh, this webinar is hosted by Skills for Growth in collaboration with our colleagues in the Resource Efficiency and Net Zero team, Carl Hurst and Rebecca Bocock. In this session, we're going to go through how to develop a green marketing strategy, benefits of cutting carbon and reducing business environmental impact, how to positively market green credentials, and how to avoid the pitfalls of greenwashing. Can I have a next slide, please, Bex? Thank you. Like I mentioned, uh, this is the final webinar in the series. If you've missed any of the workshops uh, that have been shown on the slide here, we'll be sending out the, the YouTube links and the recordings um, to all of the other areas on Friday this week. So just before uh, I hand over to Carl and Rebecca, I'm just going to go through quickly uh, just to give a, a very brief overview of the Skills for Growth SME support programme. Next slide, please. So the SME support program who are hosting today's webinar, um, we are a, a program fully funded for businesses in Greater Manchester who are really aimed at driving productivity and growth within organisations by getting them the skills that they need in order to grow uh, and be more productive as an organisation. So uh, the Skills for Growth programme, we understand what gaps you have in your organisation we then work with each of your employees to understand what they currently do in their role, what skills will make them more effective, and then we research and broker skills and training that are going to be having that impact to them. Next slide, please. Just to give an example of some of the fully funded skills that are currently available through the Skills for Growth program, we have project management, there's digital skills, there's things like digital marketing, cybersecurity, digital transformation, how to, to, to build your business online if you haven't currently got a website. Uh, there are leadership skills from across different sectors, from manufacturing, health and social care, early years, and some cross-sector stuff as well, so for other sectors that don't fall into those categories. There is sector specific skills as well within manufacturing, so things like Lean uh, Six Sigma and things like uh, implementing lean processes, lean management. In the health and social care, there's things like understanding uh, safe use of medications, understanding different ailments, those type of things as well. There is also sector specific, specific courses for early years and construction sector. Throughout the program, uh, if you are currently on the program or if you are looking to join, there is access to over 400 fully funded courses in all different areas of the program as well. Next slide. So this is how to, to access the program. If you're not already on it, you can access it through skillsforgrowthsme.co.uk. Alternatively, you can follow us on LinkedIn. Um, we will be sending out these slides afterwards. If you uh, if you do have any questions about the program or would like to join the program, please do respond to the, that email, and we can uh, we can get you and set up a call and, and go through the, the the sort of sign up process. Thank you. So now I'll pass on to uh, Bex and Carl, who will run through today's webinar. Thank you. Hey, okay, thanks, Tom. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth and final webinar in the Cut Carbon Cut Cost series. This series is an introduction to some of the themes associated with environmental sustainability and energy efficiency. And this uh, fourth session is on using your sustainability for competitive advantage. To give you an idea of how to develop a sustainable marketing st strategy and how to avoid the pitfalls of greenwashing. The presentation will be around 35 minutes long with 10 minutes at the end for any thoughts or questions. And if you have any questions, just please put them in the chat as we go along. Or as I mentioned, there's time at the end for you to unmute and ask the questions in person. So today's presenters are myself, Carl Hurst, and my colleague, Bex Bocock. We're both sustainability and net zero advisors with the Business Growth Hub. Together, we have a combined 47 years experience in the energy and environmental sectors helping businesses to cut their carbon and cut their costs. Today, I'll be starting by discussing how to develop a green or sustainable marketing strategy, promoting the good things you're doing to cut carbon or reduce your environmental impact. And then Bex will look at some of the key definitions, some of the terms that businesses use to market their green credentials. 
and how to avoid greenwashing that many businesses use that can be very confusing for customers that are trying to be more sustainable. First, I'll start by introducing what we do in the sustainability and net zero team. Our sustainability and net zero service helps businesses to minimise inefficiencies within their operations and quantify and reduce their carbon emissions. We offer on-site resource efficiency reviews and one-to-one -one support to help identify opportunities and quantify cost and carbon savings. We also help businesses to calculate their carbon footprint and develop an action plan to improve. We can help you to build a business case for investment in low carbon technologies and help you to develop an environmental strategy. We can support you to implement projects and find local suppliers with green technologies and access funding. We also run a programme of webinars similar to this series called Journey to Net Zero. It's longer and it goes into more depth and it's for businesses that would like to improve sustainability but don't know where to start. And there's a link to all our services on the slide pack. So just a quick recap for those of you that have attended some of the uh, previous webinars in the Cut Carbon Cut Cost series. As Tom said, the slides and YouTube videos are available for you all to catch up on as well. Over the last three weeks, we've introduced you to climate change, the threat to the environment, and how reducing your carbon footprint will both help your businesses and help make the world a better place to live and work. We discussed the reasons for the energy price rises and how wholesale energy prices are falling again. That are expected to remain between 50 and 100% above pre-crisis levels. We also looked at the current and future discount schemes available from the government. In the second week, we looked at ways to reduce your energy use and costs, for example, by changing lights to LEDs or installing solar panels. And last week, we discussed using these carbon savings and environmental policy and other green credentials and a net zero plan to win tenders and new business. So today, we're going to develop that a bit further. Once you've put your carbon emissions, you'll probably want to let people know about your successes. So today, we're going to look at how to develop a green or sustainable marketing strategy. It's been found that we are 22 times more likely to remember a fact when it's been wrapped within a story. Another study found that when people listen to pictures either containing facts and figures or a story, only 5% recalled the statistic but a whopping 63% remembered the stories. So with this in mind, simply stating your carbon footprint or how much carbon you saved will not be as powerful as creating a story as to why you're doing it, how you did it and who was involved, etc. This part of the webinar is looking at what to consider when developing a green marketing strategy. Many of you may not be involved in the marketing element of the business, but the next few slides will be important in aiding discussions with these marketing people so the business can promote the knowledge and actions it is taking to cut carbon and reduce its environmental impact. And that's you using the technical knowledge that we've covered in the last few weeks that your marketing colleagues don't have. What we will cover is planning your marketing strategy how to communicate and what to communicate, and where to communicate it, how to build your profile and look at really good local case study for encompassing what we've learnt. When looking at developing your marketing strategy, here are some of the things to think about. What do you want to say? What is it you're trying to do? What message do you want to promote? How do you want to promote your green credentials? Do some competitor research. Carry out market research. How are your competitors trying to promote themselves or their products as sustainable? Are there any logos 
accreditations or particular themes which are used by your sector or industry. You need to know your audience. Who's the target audience for your businesses? Are your suppliers, customers, clients and staff asking your business to have certain sustainability values and green credentials? Having third party accreditations to point to are really valuable. But if you decide not to go down this route because of the costs or the resources required, bear in mind you probably need to put more work into the content and com communications as a trade off because you'll face more in depth scrutiny of your green story. Think about how best to communicate to your audience. What channels are they already in engaged with? And what should the tone of your green message be to understand your customers? You need to understand what your customers' expectations are. Are they using your products or service to solve a particular problem? And is there a green alternative that you could develop for this? Keep in front of any areas of innovation which your product or service could support with a green agenda. I mean, you see this quite a lot within the construction industry, where they're using BREAM standards for sustainability in the built environment. And understand what your success would look like. It's very important. What would a successful green marketing strategy look like and how would it be measured? Examples could include clicks on your website, interactions on social media, you do interviews on sustainable, sustainable themes and quotes in articles which build your profile as a green business. Enter sustainable business awards. You could get higher scores in tenders and winning new work, or well, winning more new work. And feedback from your clients and staff, new products and service innovation can all be used as measures of success. Understanding how successful a strategy is, is crucial as continuous development will lead to improvement and further success of your sustainable marketing strategy. Looking at how to communicate, tone is important. You should agree a tone of voice that should remain largely consistent through all your comms, but it should be flexible. An example of different tone of voice could be whether you communicate yourself in the first or the third person or to your reader in the second or third person. The more interesting the story, the better. Include different voices from within your organisation. This shows how all the employees are on board with your company's green agenda. How frequently you communicate is important. It really does depend on the platform and the audience volume and format. For example, a study found that the average lifetime of a tweet between 15 and 20 minutes. After this time span, your followers feeds have received enough new posts that yours gets pushed to the bottom. Therefore, companies can tweet periodically throughout the day. However, the same approach wouldn't be applied to marketing emails or LinkedIn posts. And if you have a blog section on your website, don't leave it empty for months. If you don't think you can commit to regular blog posts, at least every, once, every couple of months as an absolute minimum, ideally much more regularly, don't have a blog at all. Finally, as a rule of thumb, avoid marketing communications on Mondays and Fridays. The best time is usually midweek. Think about the words to use. When communicating a green or environmental message, using buzzwords is ultimately unavoidable. Crikey. <laughs> yeah. And you won't always have space to explain what you mean. Although the CMA, the Competition and Marketing Authority's greenwashing guidelines, and always have fuller explanations and information available to link back to on your website. And Bex will cover some more about this uh, shortly. Trust, transparency and honesty are important in building your sustainable profile. And this will emphasise you're on a journey, feeding into successful storytelling marketing. Ultimately, communicating the green agenda, perhaps more than most other topics, 
is all about trust and honesty. Don't try to be something that you're not. Be genuine. As a rule of thumb, assume your audience starts from a point of scepticism. Honesty is the best policy. No company is perfect when it comes to the environmental performance. Communicating your achievements and aims while admitting this is still a work in progress will be welcomed. This box on the bottom right hand side of the slide shows Patagonia as a good example. They're one of the world's most environmentally conscious companies, but they're very clear that they're imperfect and the work is never finished. Emphasize that you're on a journey. And if you do use in-house labels and logos, make sure they're fully explained. Faith in Nature or an SME shampoo and skincare manufacturer based in Bury, who we've supported over a number of years. And their website is a great example of how to do green marketing right. They use a mix of third party certifications, for example, the Vegan Society, Cruelty Free International, mixed together with in house ones, 100% recycled and recyclable, made in the UK, biodegradable. They have a lot of information on their website about their products, packaging and sustainability values. And they admit they aren't perfect, but they are transparent about where they're at on their journey. For example, they use a trace amount of palm oil in their products. And we know that palm oil is a contentious ingredient due to its link with deforestation. But they have chosen approved sustainable, sustainably resourced suppliers and have minimised the amount of uh, palm oil that they use as much as they can. There are a multitude of platforms that can be included in your green marketing strategy with different platforms having different purposes. Additionally, the tone for social media is slightly more informal. Blogs and opinion pieces, case studies and news articles are more factual and contain data analysis. As discussed in earlier slides, the frequency of posts and articles will largely depend on the platform being utilised. Regardless of the platform you use, ensure the information is up to date. And although you should avoid telling the same story across all the channels, there should be consistency in the message. Think about the content on your website. As the first port of call for stakeholders, your website should be treated as your environmental disclosure platform. Your website should have easily accessible information about your actions, aims, strategy and journey. And as covered in last week's webinar, your environmental policy. Consider ideas for blogs and communications. Over the last couple of years, industry and, gov industry and government announcements on the green agenda came thick and fast, heightened by the momentum around COP26 in Glasgow. Piggyback on these announcements were relevant for example, when the government publishes its building strategy or its transport decarbonisation strategy, use it as an opportunity to show your stakeholders what you're doing on buildings or transport. Watch out for research and reports in your, se reports in your sector. Do industry associations, for example, make for UK manufacturers? Sign up to newsletters or RSS feeds and set Google alerts for key terms relating to your business. Also, follow and connect with businesses and sustainability leaders on LinkedIn and comment on sustainability issues to build your green profile. So when building your profile as a business, think about what is best for you. What opportunities are out there for collaboration? What networks do you belong to? or active in, or could you join? For example, there are some groups on LinkedIn, there's a Greater Manchester Social Value Network, and there might be sector specific networks, such as the Supply Chain Sustainability School, IEMA, the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment, or MAST, Manchester Arts Sustainability Team, or something like the Chartered Institute of Waste Management. 
become something of a guru. Put yourself forward to speak about the successes of your business in cutting carbon and cutting costs. Applying all the material we've covered to deliver an engaging and successful marketing strategy is Crystal Doors, a Rochdale business that makes vinyl wrap doors for kitchens, bedrooms and bathrooms. Despite the company being 27 years old, Crystal Doors only began to embrace sustainability in 2017, but has since become a pioneer for sustainability in the manufacturing sector. Crystal Doors' efforts to communicate its progress and strategy has been key to its success in environmental circles. They would not have been awarded their Queen's Award without it. The effort and time that they've put in has already been paid back a thousandfold through the publicity and recognition that they've gained. And on this page, we can see collaboration with other organisations. They're promoted on the Business Growth Hub website and through LinkedIn. They have a blog on the website and many case studies. They also use a number of different staff members to show everyone who's on board with their green agenda. Their YouTube interviews with sector specific organisations and tweets from third parties about the awards that they have received. And if you were to Google Crystal Doors, all of this other information comes up as well as their website. And it adds real credibility to the business. They haven't done anything really innovative just talking about the sustainability journey that they've been on and promoting their green credentials. They became carbon neutral last year and tell everyone about its ben their benefits, about cutting carbon and cutting costs. So now I'd like a bit of uh, feedback from you all. What are the benefits of having a more sustainable business? Could you please unmute and shout out or add, uh, add your thoughts into the chat. Then have you got a, any thoughts about the benefits of cutting carbon? OK, then well, these are some of the benefits that we've covered in the last uh, last four weeks. Reducing costs, reducing your energy use, for example, LEDs or better controls, reduces carbon dioxide and also reduces your costs. You can increase profitability or alternatively increase your competitiveness. You can improve envi the environment for staff and for neighbours by reducing fumes or noise nuisance. You reduce waste, and reuse and recycle what you can. We covered last week, you can win and retain customers, work with clients, and have a carbon reduction plan to help you to win tenders. Green credentials help staff recruitment and retention by showing that you're a good business to work for and engage staff come up with good ideas and are more likely to be happy to implement changes. Partnerships with your supply chain can bring carbon and cost reductions to benefit you all. What we're trying to demonstrate here is that there are many benefits to reducing your carbon footprint and you can use the different benefits to communicate your green credentials to different audiences. It's about getting a consistent message across to all the stakeholders that you're trying to influence and in the forums that they will see it. Let's go back over some of the things we've covered today. When developing a green marketing strategy, you need to think about what you're trying to promote or achieve. Do your market research. What is your industry doing? What are your competitors doing? Are there any cre green credentials that you need? What do your customers want? If the product already has green credentials, interrogate these. Think about who you, who's your audience and what channels and tone you should be using for these. Consider what success looks like. Monitor the website hits or responses to uh, LinkedIn posts, likes, replies and shares. Increase business and partnerships, measure that. 
measure the decrease in calls or requests for information on your green credentials. Use your marketing team to help you build your green credentials into your brand and marketing guidelines. And make sure your website is up to date, especially you have sustainable accreditations which need to be recertified by a certain date. Remember to consider what words to use. You want to position yourself as being at the start of your green journey, so that you're in it for the long haul and we'll keep chipping away at it. Also, you don't need to be seen as innovative. You need to be seen as open, transparent and trustworthy by stating facts and your intentions. This will help you to engage with new clients and open conversations with suppliers. As they know, having robust environmental credentials is important to you as a business, ultimately making life easier within the whole value chain. That's the end of my bit. Has anyone got any questions so far? OK, I'll now hand you over to Bex to explain some of the jargon used in sustainability and avoiding greenwashing. Thank you, Carl. <clears throat> um, hope you can all hear me OK. Um, so Carl has discussed what should be considered when implementing a marketing strategy, which is focused around your sustainability journey. But for this part of the session, I really wanted to define key sustainability jargon that may be used in your marketing strategy and fundamentally how to avoid greenwashing. Within this space, there are so many different terms, phrases, acronyms that are used, and it can be really confusing to understand what they all mean. However, it is key that you completely understand the terms that are using to ensure that you are communicating your message accurately. So as an example, you might actually think that these terms are interchangeable. However, each have very different definitions, which if misused could actually be misleading your audience. So when I speak to organisations and we want to have a discussion about net zero, this is the first thing that I sit down and speak to them about because it's really important to know the difference between um, these five different terms. So in terms of net zero, and this is when the amount of greenhouse gas emissions going into the atmosphere are balanced by the same amount of greenhouse gases being removed from the atmosphere. And fundamentally and importantly, when we're talking about net zero, we have this focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions to the point that they can't be reduced anymore and then offsetting that remaining balance. How the neutral, on the other hand, is about balancing greenhouse gas emissions by offsetting. But what we mean when we talk about carbon neutral is that if a company knew what their carbon footprint was, they could just buy the carbon offsetting credits that are equivalent to their emissions. So any company in the room right now, if they knew what their carbon footprint was they could become a carbon neutral company tomorrow if they was able to buy that equivalent amount of carbon offsetting credits. So straight away here we can see the difference between net zero and carbon neutral in that net zero really needs a lot more commitment from a business to to get to that point um, and carbon neutral is more more so you know a financial transaction if you like. Zero carbon is all about reducing emissions to absolute zero without offsetting. And then carbon negative and carbon positive is all about when a business removes more emissions from the atmosphere than they emit. So as you can see from these four definitions, if you was a company that wanted to use carbon offsettings within your journey to net zero, for example, if you was to market your company as a zero carbon company straight away you would be greenwashing even though that wouldn't necessarily be you know your intention it's just really trying to home in here the importance of understanding the the words that you're using within your marketing strategy so we have put together a bit of a jargon buster there at the bottom um, and, and this is sort of a net zero jargon buster. There's all these different phrases here and definitions around net zero, but then some, um, yeah, some other sustainability related terms in there, which might be useful to have a look at after this session. 
So we have discussed here that carbon offsetting will play a part, you know, within your journey to net zero or if you're looking at carbon neutral. And we don't really have time today to cover what carbon offsetting is and the depths that it does require. But put very simply, carbon offsetting um, broadly refers to the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions or an increase in carbon storage. And this can be through land restoration or the planting of trees um, that is used to compensate for emissions that occur elsewhere. <coughs> so as a, bit, as a bit of a summary, as I say, um, we're not going to go into the depths of, of carbon offsetting today. Um, you can find out a little bit more if you wanted to come on that journey to net zero cohort programme. But really, as a, as a summary, the true benefit really of, of a carbon offsetting scheme is in, uncertain. You know, you might buy those carbon credits for a certain tree, but that tree might die before it gets to the point of sequestering the carbon that you've emitted, for example. And really, those carbon offsets can only be estimated. With energy efficiency, so, you know, investing in your building to, you know, to improvements to improve efficiency, that will bring financial reward to your business and actually eliminate those emissions. So it really is worth investing in your business. You know, there is also this idea that it could be appear to be shirking your responsibility or greenwashing as we've just discussed then um and also we've all we've all heard of the low quality offset scandals that have been in, reported in the press but you know we've just discussed that carbon offsetting is likely to play a role in your um transition to net zero or your carbon neutral goals so if you are going to offset what we say is do the offsetting as a last resort, you know, improve the efficiencies of your building, purchase renewable energy from suppliers, maybe even install renewable energies on your site. Do your research, um, and, and by this we mean choose quality over price. If a carbon offset seems to be a very cheap price, the likeliness is, is you know, it is too good to be true. <laughs> we say look out for the verification. So when you go to buy carbon credits, there should be, you know, a standard associated with that carbon credit. So things to look out for is the gold standard, and this is delivered through WWF. There's also the UK Woodland Carbon Code, which is another good standard to look for when, you, when you're looking into carbon credits. And very, you know, Broadly, these verifications just reassure, they give you the reassurance of the validity of those carbon credits. Within that validity, there'll be audits of the carbon credits. So, for example, you know, once you have purchased a carbon credit for said tree, is that carbon credit then retired? What you might see in those poor quality um, carbon offsettings is that they might be a, a hectare of trees and that those carbon credits are sold to multiple people um so yeah that's something to to look out for and also very importantly be transparent in both your internal and your external communications of which carbon offsetting um credits you're using your your source of your credits that sort of thing um, and as Carl mentioned earlier, you know, it, it does tell a good story where you are supporting these business, uh, these these projects around the world. So it does tie all together quite nicely. But yeah, being very transparent with your um, where you're using carbon credits. So moving on to greenwashing here, um, you may have heard of the term greenwash or greenwashing in the media. And it's used to describe the practice of companies launching adverts, campaigns, products, etc., under the pretense that they are environmentally beneficial, but when this is in contradiction to their environmental and sustainability record in general. <clears throat> and the way that we can look at greenwashing, and it has really become a many headed beast, and greenwashing strategies are becoming increasingly more sophisticated. Greenwashing is no longer simply lying or misleading the consumer about the biodegradability of a coffee cup, for example. Now, 
what we're going to run through here is these different types of greenwashing and hopefully this will give you some of the tools to really think about um when you know when you're given a, a environmental claim you the tools to dig a little bit deeper into thinking is that a greenwash is that a reliable claim for example now what i'm going to run through you know pre jan th this came out in january 2023 so very much hot off the press um, and this breakdown of greenwashing is um, it can be broken down into six shades of green uh, if you like. So the first that we're going to look at here is green crowding and this is built on the belief that you can hide in a crowd to do avoid discovery. It really does rely on safety in numbers and if sustainability policies are being developed it is likely that this group will move at the speed of the slowest. Green lighting, um, and this is probably one of the ones that we're most aware of in the room. Um, and this is when a company's communications, including their advertisements, spotlight a particularly green feature of its operations or products, however small this might actually be, in order to draw attention away from the environmentally damaging activities that are being conducted elsewhere. We will actually look at an example of this um, on, on, in a couple of slides time. Green shifting is when companies imply that the consumer is at fault and shift the blame onto them. Green labelling is a practice where marketers call something green or sustainable, but a closer examination reveals that their words are misleading. Next, we have green rinsing, and this refers to when a company regularly changes its ESG targets before they are actually achieved. And then finally, another layer of this three shades of green is the green hushing. And this is all about um, when corporate management teams under report or hide their sustainability credentials in order to evade investor scrutiny. So I hope that just gives you a little bit of you know some things to look out for when you're when you see these sustainability claims that it isn't just um you know a company saying that it's made out of 50 percent um you know recyclable material there's so many more layers to greenwashing it is so much more complicated hopefully to bring this together i've got a couple of real life examples of um greenwashing that i've pulled from the internet and um, you might have you might be aware of these or, or not, but to begin with, we have this paper quote and quote paper bottle. And this is as simple as greenwashing really gets. You know, I when I saw this, I really did think to myself, this has just got to be an example to, to demonstrate what greenwashing might look like. But no, this is a real thing that a, a company decided to do. And it's as simple as as it says there, you know they marketed the bottle to say that there is it is a paper bottle but on further inspection it was actually a paper bottle encased in a in a paper sling sling a little bit more complicated here is um so back in 2019 Ryanair claimed it had the lowest carbon emissions of any major airline and this was based on CO2 emissions per passenger per kilometre flown. And they argued that this is because they had the youngest fleet, highest proportion of seats filled on flights and the newest, most fuel efficient engines. So from us as a consumer, that also sounds quite good, doesn't it? But in reality, the data that was presented to the advertising standard were from 2011. They failed to define what was included at what was a major airline and in addition to this some well-known airlines did not actually appear on the chart that they presented so it wasn't actually clear whether they had been measured another example here is the british cycling so they are facing criticism at the minute from environmental campaign groups um, and this is because they have just signed a long-term partnership deal with shell the partnership, which was announced um, just last October, that runs until the end of 2030. And basically, they're saying that it's all about helping um, to accelerate British cycling's path to net zero. But environmental groups and probably those in the room are thinking, you know, how can something, of, you know, something like Shell be 
you know, um, sort of helping something like British Cycling on their pathway to net zero. So, yeah, environmental groups have actually condemned the move as an attempt by Shell to greenwash its harmful activities. So earlier when we was, when we were talking about green lighting, think of it like Shell have got these really harmful activities happening and they are doing a lot of marketing that they are supporting British Cycling. And it's all about distracting that consumer from actually what, fundamentally are the activities of, of Shell. And finally, another one that you might be aware of is um, there's COP27, which happened last year. And this is the United Nations Climate Change Conference. And this was actually sponsored by Coca-Cola. Um, break free from plastic. Um, these guys are a global alliance of organisations and individuals, and they said that the Coca-Cola sponsoring the COP27 is pure greenwash. And this was really due, due to the fact that Coca-Cola is actually one of the biggest users of plastic. And, you know, it's astounding that a company so tied up to the fossil fuel industry is allowed to sponsor and, you know, have a seat at the table. That's such a vital climate meeting. So hopefully that gives you some of some different examples there of the different types of greenwashing. Just one more to include here. Um, this is a key example of where it's really important to use the correct wording. So Windex claimed to be the world's first window cleaner bottle made from 100% recycled ocean plastic. Now to you and me, ocean plastic suggests that the plastic was actually retrieved from ocean. Um, but actually the plastic was sourced from plastic banks in Haiti, the Philippines and Indonesia. Um, and it was actually plastic that would otherwise have leaked into the ocean. So the reality of it is, is that it was ocean bound plastic, not actually, you know, plastic scoops from the ocean. The Competitions and Markets Authority, which Carl mentioned earlier, they found that 40% of sustainability related claims by businesses online could be misleading. And some of the common issues were that products were routinely being labelled organic or recycled, despite not containing the majority organic ingredients or recycled content. Another one was in that products were labelled as free from um, microplastic beads. So if you remember the, the little beads that you used to get in your face washes and within that marketing, they would say, you know, we're free from plastic micro beads and like others. But actually, in fact, micro beads have actually been banned across the UK for several years now. So it is really important to get your messaging right for a number of reasons, you know, investors and regulatory pressures, we, you know, existing customer concerns, people, you know, customers are taking, have, they, they want the bit the, where they spend their money for people to be thinking about these sort of things. Um, there is also a reputational risk associated with greenwashing and you really don't want to become a company that potential stakeholders do not trust. And then this in turn could affect tra attracting new customers, markets, and then even employees. And really importantly, there is also a growing financial risk. Um, and this is all around that the Competitions and Markets Authority has new powers to issue fines where companies are found to be greenwashing. And we're seeing these talks um, increasing in the media and what's coming out to say that there should be more financial um, penalties when companies are seen to be greenwashing. And this is moving um, and it, it will change. So how to avoid greenwashing? Again, re referencing the Competitions and Markets Authority, they recommend that information is accurate, that claims are clear, unambiguous and also understood by consumers. We might think um, that, you know, you don't be using jargon that not all your customers can understand, for example, that important information is not omitted or hidden deliberately. Now that one, you know, think back to that Ryanair example that we looked at a minute ago that um, fair and meaningful comparisons can be made between different products and that the full life cycle of a product is taken into account. Um, 
And finally, that claims can be substantiated. You know, businesses must be able to back up claims with robust, credible and up to date evidence when challenged by a consumer or an interested group. So in the UK, the CMA investigate how products and services claiming to be eco-friendly are being marketed and whether consumers could be being misled. They've recently published new guidance on making environmental claims as part of the consumer protection law, and it will become easier, potentially more common for consumers or trading standing bodies to bring legal action against businesses making misleading claims. So in terms of this checklist here of what we've got to um what we can do to avoid greenwashing you know apply that to your own marketing strategy they all the you know the things that you're saying as a business but also when you're looking at other businesses and what they are doing again mark them against this checklist just to see if there's anything that you can spot out that might be actually um greenwashing um and that's it from me i don't know if anyone's got any questions that they wanted uh that you know feel free to put that in the chat um or unmute and shout at me and Carl. We'll do our best to answer the questions. If that isn't the case, um, thank you for joining us. So as Tom said at the start of this webinar, this series will be available from Monday the 17th, uh, Friday, sorry, Friday the 17th of March um, at this below link. If you are interested in this this journey to net zero program so this is just part part of the things that we we uh, cover within that cohort program you can also find details of that on the skills for growth website but thank you very much for listening bye bye from